All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep, good to go. Cool. Thanks, Troy. Thanks to um, the organizers at NVIDIA and my colleagues at, at NERSC for putting this on. And thanks to all of you for, for being here and listening. Um, I'm, a, I'm Steve Farrell. I'm a machine learning engineer at NERSC. I'm in the data and analytics services group. Broadly, my job is to support machine learning workloads on our NERSC high performance computing systems. Um, I will um, talk a little bit about um, the kinds of things that we do at NERSC. I, I won't go too much into introductory things. I'll say a little bit about AI for science and, and our perspective from an HPC center. But of course, there's going to be more introductory stuff coming up later. So I apologize if I sort of gloss over things that may be of interest to you, uh, but happy to supplement with questions afterwards or discussions on Slack. And I think I'm all ready to go here. Um, yeah, unfortunately we can't, we, we can't actually use a nurse system today. We were really, really hoping to be able to use Perlmutter resources for the hands-on stuff today. And in fact, that's why we delayed this event from, from last year, but uh, you know, it, these kinds of systems are complicated. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention shortly that we're in the process of upgrading the system. It's just, it's very hard to predict how things are going to be. We actually probably could have used Perlmutter today in the end, but there was a lot of uncertainty yesterday and we had to make a decision and had to pull the plug. So we're very grateful that NVIDIA has resources that they can spin up so quickly for events like this. Um, yeah, so I'll say a little bit about AI for science, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about NERSC. I'll talk about our, our AI strategy, what we're doing to, to enable and support cutting edge AI for science applications. I'll mention some of our offerings in terms of hardware, software, and things like that. Um, I'll talk about what we're actually doing on the front lines with scientists and researchers to develop applications and and um, and push in new directions um, and a little bit of our efforts on uh, outreach and trying to empower the community. All right, so we're all here presumably because we're interested in science, we're working on science and we probably um, are all interested, working on interesting problems and are aware of AI's potential to enhance our research um, to really transform the, the kinds of science that we're doing. Uh, and in fact, AI, um, as, as, we're, as, as it's being rapidly adopted across uh, many domains of science, we're seeing that it can be applied almost um, in any kind of science domain. I don't really know of any that, that it has not yet you know, been considered um, potentially transformative. Um, but even within specific science domains, um, AI broadly can be applied to a lot of different aspects of our research workflows, um, including but not limited to the, the things that I have here, such as analysis of large data sets. So, um, um, of course, AI is not only limited to large data sets, but when we talk about the, the modern techniques in AI with deep learning and deep neural networks, they really shine when we have large data sets. And uh, when I say analysis of large data sets, that can also mean a few things. So um, we know that, that um, AI gives us methods that can learn directly from data. And in many cases, uh, um, these learned models can actually get more out of our data than we can with hand engineered features by you know, learning the complex features that are needed to solve a specific problem. Um, AI can also help us in cases where uh, maybe we don't really have a great traditional solution to a problem. Uh, maybe instead we rely on hand labeling data, scanning through data, um, which is tedious and limits how much we can do, of course, uh, with our grad student armies, right? Um, but with AI, we can automate a lot of that. So um, that's just a couple of things so far. Uh, another big one is acceleration of expensive simulations. And this is especially relevant from the HPC uh, facility perspective, um, but also broadly in science. We know that we rely a lot on having physical models of the world, of having simulations that can go from initial conditions to you know, final conditions or from first principles to some observed quantities. 
And very, very often, uh, the amount of science we can do is actually limited uh, in terms of the, the computational resources that we can commit to that. Uh, sometimes these, these computations, like uh, performing density functional theory on a very large system of atoms, uh, just the computational need just explodes and that limits what we can actually do or our ability to model the climate of the earth. We can do things at low resolution. Uh, maybe we even have good physical models uh, for the smaller scale physics, uh, but to try and model the entire earth at the high resolution needed is pretty much impossible with today's resources. So again, science is limited by that. So AI uh, can potentially have a really big impact here in, in replacing or supplementing, somehow augmenting these simulation workflows. And there are cases where maybe you just replace uh, one piece of the computation, for example, replace density functional theory with an AI model that can predict the energy and forces on the system, um, or a place where you just completely throw out a simulation and replace it with uh, a generative model. Um, a third area could be control of complex experiments. So this can be things like um, particle accelerator beams or uh, fusion reactors, where these traditionally rely a lot on the expertise of engineers to hand tune the parameters to get what they want. Um, you, you may have seen a paper from DeepMind not too long ago where they had like really great results on controlling a tokamak fusion reactor with, with AI and, and um, showing that they could do, I think even go beyond things that, that an, an expert engineer could do. Uh, so AI is, um, is really enthusiastically being adopted by the science communities, uh, both in the DOE and the NSF and beyond. Uh, so we see a recent AI wave here. There are a lot of, I think, science domains that are still waking up to the, the capabilities of AI. But uh, luckily, we're also seeing, I think, in a lot of areas, um, uh, research moving from proof of concept to maturity, or things are actually getting sophisticated enough, mature enough, where they can actually be used to do scientific discovery or be used in scientific production. Uh, of course, that doesn't say that the, the story is done here. There's still a lot of work needed, um, which is why we're all here, so that we can learn more about AI and how to apply it to our problems. And um, as things keep growing, as things keep getting more sophisticated, as we tackle more and more complex problems, the, the computational needs of AI uh, become quite demanding and they're still growing. So HPC centers like NURSE can play a really important role, um, not only because they provide those needed uh, computational resources with large scale, high performance computing systems, um, but also the expertise for how to deploy those workloads. Um, because it, it, it turns out that it's still non-trivial to deploy, let's say a massively parallel model training of some of the biggest cutting edge state-of-the-art deep learning models that are out there today. So hopefully that'll get better over time, but that's the situation now. Uh, so introduction to NERSC. So um, NERSC is the National Energy Research Scientific and Computing Center. We are the Mission HPC Center for the Department of Energy Office of Science. Um, we are located at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. <clears throat> and by Mission HPC Center, I mean that we, uh, we cover the whole mission of the Department of Energy Office of Science, all science domains that the Department of Energy funds and cares about. Uh, they potentially get time on our systems. In fact, the DOE decides most, they allocate most of the hours on our systems. So we have a very large and diverse user base, lots of different kinds of science being done on our systems. In terms of the systems we have today, we have Cori, uh, which is a CPU, um, basically Intel processor based system, and then Perlmutter, which is our newer system that has NVIDIA A100 GPUs, over 6,000 of them. And this is the one that we're particularly excited about for AI methods. Um, okay, I'll get a little bit more now into our, our strategy of what we're doing to support and enable cutting edge AI methods for science. So sort of three categories here that uh, should be fairly digestible. So first we have to deploy, we try to deploy optimized systems for AI for science, uh, both hardware and software. Um, uh, but we've, we found that that's really not enough. You can't just have a system that's, that's well optimized. We also have to be there in the weeds. We have to make sure that we have the expertise um, and, and also be on the front lines to try and push on methods and tools. So we do engage a bit with the community, with scientists. We have postdocs that we hire at, at NURSE to work on research problems, applying AI for science. <clears throat> and then the third thing is empowerment. So we do a bit of outreach. We do seminars, workshops, 
training events and schools, which I'll say a little bit more about. And, and of course, this is one example, of this event today. So in the deployment category, say a little bit more about Perlmutter now. Sorry again that you're not able to use it today, but um, hopefully there's enough stuff in the presentation here that um, you'll be able to, to go back and try it out later if you already have an account. If you don't, then maybe you can request one. Um, happy to uh, talk with people about how to do that if they need. Perlmutter is uh, a system from HPE. Um, actually, it's a Cray Shasta system. When we first started procuring it, it was just from Cray and then Cray was bought by HPE. Uh, so last year we deployed the phase one system, which was all of the GPU nodes. So we had 12 GPU cabinets. Each node has four NVIDIA Ampere A100 GPUs. In total, we have over 6,000 of these GPUs. So it's pretty sizable. Um, a fairly substantial uh, all flash luster storage system. Um, that's not available right now because of the upgrade is one of the problems. Um, and then the phase two upgrade is what's happening now. Uh, this brings in a whole CPU only partition to Perlmutter in addition to the GPU partition. So nodes without GPUs for uh, workloads that either don't yet use GPUs or, or don't need them. Uh, it also brings an upgrade to the network. And, and this is actually the part that's really impacting the GPU nodes as well. Um, here's a picture of our, our group lead Wahid over here in front of Perlmutter, but we need a newer picture because actually Perlmutter is a bit bigger now. The whole CPU partition means that it extends a bit in that direction. Um, and one other thing to say here is NVIDIA was, very, was kind enough to call this the, the world's fastest AI supercomputer when we turned it on. <laughs> All right, so uh, part of our strategy is to kind of track what's going on in the community and in our users. So we do see a growing scientific AI workload at NERSC. And of course we anticipate that to keep growing as people uh, put their workloads onto Perlmutter, which is particularly well suited for these kinds of workloads. So um, we do that and if we track these things in a few ways. One is that we can actually track the machine learning software usage, at least to some extent on our systems. Some of this is not yet working on Perlmutter, but that's still in progress. But in principle, if somebody does like module load, PyTorch or TensorFlow, we can log that. And we have a way to log Python imports so we can see what Python packages people are using. And for example, we see like on this, this bar chart on the right, you can see how we've seen, you know, six times growth from 2018 to 2021. And then TensorFlow and PyTorch um, will hopefully have um, you know, another much larger um, extension of that soon. Uh, we also put on a survey. We've been doing this about every two years. There's one going on right now um, where we ask the scientific community, uh, including nurse users, which I think make up probably most of it, what they're doing, what kinds of problems they're working on, what are their computational needs, uh, what kinds of software they're using, the tools they need, uh, how they're using nurse systems and, and stuff like that. Um, so I, I said there's one ongoing right now. Um, it'd be really great if you're applying machine learning to science, if you would help us out by filling that survey, there's a link at the bottom. I did share these slides on the Slack presentation channel. I can also dump them in the Zoom chat or uh, share them in any way that, that you need. Uh, so I'll have some plots that come out of those, those surveys. Um, I don't have the preliminary ones from this year. The conclusions are not too different, but I can point out ways where, they're, where the trends are changing here. Uh, one thing we see is from the, the users out there, from the community, uh, we see a really a need for large scale resources and for parallelization, basically motivating the need for HPC systems. Um, our users can sometimes um, take days or weeks to train their machine learning models. They can have large data sets of hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes, and even into um, getting into petabytes now these days. Um, I, I, I don't have anything on the different ways to parallelize machine learning workloads, like training machine learning workloads today. Uh, we actually have a whole tutorial on that and I'll share a link later on. Um, but there are, but just, you know, just to say briefly that there are various ways to parallelize machine learning workloads on systems. And we, we also ask our users about the kinds of things they're doing. Data parallelism is one that, that's kind of most prevalent today, uh, but we're already seeing as models get bigger, um, a need for more kinds of parallelism, like model parallelism and, and things like that. And, um, and so that, that kind of comes back to that point I said before that it's still non-trivial, it still can be challenging to, to deploy these kinds of sophisticated parallel workloads on HPC systems. So we do what we can to try and educate the community and make it easier. 
Uh, we know that our scientists need performing and flexible software uh, that enables their productivity. They need to be able to iterate quickly and try things out. You don't want to be bottlenecked um, because the system or your software is slow. So they not only need things that run fast, but they also need flexibility. So people need to be able to um, add whatever packages are relevant to their domain or their application area. Um, and, and at NURSE, we, we deploy these things in a few different ways. We enable our users to uh, use either software we provide or to install their own. So we do provide custom built modules. Users can do, for example, module load PyTorch and have uh, an installation that, that they know is um, you know, built and optimized for our systems. Uh, but people can also build their own custom Conda, Conda environments um, and they can use containers. So we support containers through our shifter runtime system and um, uh, a really, a really important thing for this on Perlmutter is NVIDIA's offerings, these NGC containers that tend to be very cutting edge. They always have the latest um, NVIDIA GPU software stack, CUDA and CUDA and Nickel and things like this. Uh, and so we, we increasingly rely a lot on these containers and encourage our, our users to, to use those. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll skip quickly to, to catch back up a little bit on time here, but we know that scientists also need productive interfaces. Jupyter is a very popular service at NERSC. Uh, we have over 2000 users and, and users are able actually to, to use Jupyter on Perlmutter for their machine learning workloads. You can request a GPU node, you can use software kernels we provide, or you can, um, you can bring your own. Um, and then on top of that, users also need systems and platforms for managing all their experimentation, uh, their exploration to find what models are best for their problems, uh, things like ray tune and weights and biases. Um, so we don't like pick and choose any specific offerings here, but we, we do like weights and biases and ray tune for our own usage and we try to make sure <coughs> these things work and encourage people to try them out and let us know if they have problems. Um, and then what do we do to make sure our systems and software are optimized? Well, one important aspect of that is, is benchmarking. And this is something that I personally spend a lot of time on. So uh, MLPerf is this <clears throat> standard machine learning performance benchmarking effort um, from ML Commons. It's, it's, the, it's the industry standard these days. And uh, working with a bunch of sites, we, we, we put together an MLPerf HPC benchmark suite that actually brings in scientific applications uh, that have the kinds of attributes that we think are important for pushing on HPC systems. So things like 3D volumetric cosmology data, high resolution climate images, or um, atomic systems for graph neural networks. Um, and so this has been a really valuable effort for us. It's also been pretty successful with a couple of submission rounds. We have measurements from systems all over the world, 31 submissions, I think in the last, in the last round, we present results at supercomputing. Uh, and for us personally, this has been great in participating to help us shake out the issues in Perlmutter to understand its performance characteristics and what it takes to, to get performance out of it. And then we can pass that knowledge on to our users now I'll switch a little bit into the application side of things. Uh, this is mainly highlighting work that some of our awesome postdocs are doing right now and, and that um, have interesting sophisticated aspects of the work. I'll just skip that slide. Um, but this first one is this self-supervised sky survey work. So my colleague Peter Harrington works with George Stein and some others on this. Uh, so this is looking at images of galaxies from sky surveys, where in this case we have um, a lot of data, but not a lot of labeled data. And so this is a technique, semi supervised learning. It's, it's actually, so something that was working well in, in industry and natural images cases called contrastive representation learning, uh, where you have a way of augmenting your images with things that you think are physically relevant, like flips and rotations and shifts. Um, and then you train a model basically to learn that, you know, these similar things should, should be close together in some representation space and other images should be far apart. And you can use this to pre-train a model uh, without labels, and then you can fine tune on a um, subset data set with labels and, and get more out of your data set that way. And then they're actually looking for, I didn't, I didn't say this, they're looking for these strong lens gravitational candidates where um, um, a galaxy gets distorted by gravity and can look like this sort of ring pattern here, which is pretty cool. Uh, this work is called Forecast Net. This is um, led by some of our postdocs. Jadeep was a former postdoc now at NVIDIA. Shashank is a current postdoc and, and Peter works on this as well. Uh, we work a lot with NVIDIA folks on this one. Um, this is kind of taking 
uh, atmospheric modeling with deep learning to the next level. It's using an interesting Fourier transform based operator um, and using um, basically a, um, an attention mechanism here to, to really be able to do this at, at higher resolution that was done before in deep learning models and bringing the precision up to the level of, of numerical models, but being much, much faster. So again, this is a case that you know will potentially open the door to um, letting us really uh, be able to do better science in, in modeling the climate of the earth. And uh, well, one other thing to mention about this is if you watch like the GTC keynotes from Jensen Huang, you, you know, he, he talks about this, uh, this work here. Uh, this last one is another interesting case. This is also one of our benchmarks in that MLPERF HPC suite. Uh, this is the, from the Open Catalyst project where they're, they're trying to find new catalysts for energy storage, trying to combat climate change related things. Um, and so uh, this is where you use density functional theory that's very expensive and slow, but you can replace that with graph neural networks to model that system and, uh, and, and get good speed up. So uh, we had a postdoc, uh, Brandon, working on this, who's now at, at Meta, and it's a collaboration with CMU and Meta. Uh, they, have the, um, they put out a very large and um, diverse data set for this. There's a NeurIPS challenge and um, a lot of cool work coming out of there. And um, one thing that Brandon was able to show on this work is that larger models in this case uh, do better. So they're you know, working on scaling up to large systems. And um, basically out of time. So I'll just say really quickly, we do a lot again in empowerment and training. Uh, we have done a deep learning for science school at Berkeley lab. We've had two iterations of this, one in 2019, which was in person. Uh, and, and then in 2020, that was an online webinar series. Uh, you can get videos and slides and everything on these web pages. We do a deep learning at scale tutorial. Here, the focus is really on performance and how to scale up the training of a neural network model uh, to a large system and all the tricks that you might need to use there. Uh, all the materials available, we have videos, you can check that out. It's accepted again for supercomputing this year. So if you're there, please check us out. And then things like this boot camp, which we're doing right now. Um, I think I'll just very quickly Maybe I'll mostly skip the conclusions here. I'm trying to say, you know, AI for science needs supercomputers. Uh, we see that the the field of scientific AI is growing and, and becoming more sophisticated, which is great to see. Still work to do though, uh, and so we're doing our best to contribute to that. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or want to ask about collaborations. We're also hiring, and there's a link down here with some uh, some openings for postdocs and engineers. And that's all. Thank you. Sorry for running a little over time. Nope, that was perfect. Um, yeah, great to see what's happening. Um, so now let's go ahead and dive into our boot camp. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Caleb. Hey, good morning, evening, afternoon, everybody. I uh, just wanted to say, Stephen, that was awesome. I could have I listened and, and looked at way more projects. So if you have a 